Good morning. Hello. It's good to see you again today. We're glad to have you with us. And we are continuing in the book of Revelation. Looking forward to that. We just finished not long ago the Gospel of John. And so this becomes the other end, the bookend, to what John revealed to us then, showing us Jesus Christ as the Son of God, calling us to faith in Christ. Now we see Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation coming back and, and completing all things. We see Jesus Christ transforming all things bringing an end to the promises of God's Word, fulfilling the promises of God's Word. Um, we're living in a, in a culture that's upside down in our, in, our, in our lives and relationships and everything around us. It just seems like there's just so much happening all the time. It is really appropriate to just take a glimpse at this book, not only to look ahead, but look at the promises of God and, and re realize that they are so significantly important to how we are living right now in 2020, almost into 2021, enabling us to be people of grace, to be people of victory, overcomers, uh, to engage a world that's changing so much that the Word of God speaks to prophetically that's going to happen and take place. As we look at the uh, book of Revelation, we see its general breakdown. We're going to uh, arrive at verse 19 here in just a few weeks, but we're not there yet. But we see here that John writes about things that he has seen things that, that are currently, and things that are to be. And so we break that down, and as we break that down, we see, we see glimpses of Christ. We see Jesus Christ, he's transformed. He's not the Jesus that, the same that John saw in the Gospel of John. He ascended, he's with God, he's in glory now, and, and, and John gets a, a completely different glimpse of, of Jesus Christ as Savior. We see in chapters 4 and 5 that he's worthy to transform. We see the we see the deity of Jesus Christ there. And then we see him, he is the means of transformation. He's the one who's going to bring about the change that's going to take place. He's transforming all things, even now. And so as we, as we look at this breakdown, we're in that first section, chapters 1, 2, and 3. And we're looking at this. John's writing about things that he has seen. And so what has he seen? He's seen Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ transformed. Jesus Christ glorified. Jesus Christ in a manner that he's never seen him before. Even at that brief glimpse at the Mount of Transfiguration, when he saw Jesus Christ just let go a little bit of his glory, this is far different than that even. And we see Jesus Christ exalted and ministering to his church. The purpose is to encourage the church, to encourage them to live faithfully, to live uh, to holy lives. It's to give, to give us a glimpse into what God's going to do in the future, his program his promises, the kingdom that he's promised to us, and ultimately is to reveal Christ, is to show us Jesus Christ. We see that in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. The call, the challenge to us here is that you and I who are listening and proclaiming the word of God is that we're ready. That when Jesus comes and, and he puts into action this final timetable, that we're ready, that we are in relationship with Jesus Christ. And I pray this morning that you indeed are. As we come to our text this morning, the real challenge is this. Uh, words matter in our life. Things that we say matter. Uh, are we, do we keep our word, our promises? Do our, word, our words convey so much about who we are, what's important to us? And we, we're going to see here in this text that the words are so significant to us. I want to read just the text first as we begin. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 4. So John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. He has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and, and, a fa and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Bless the power of your word into our life by the Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in at chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And the first thing that we see is... We, as this unfolds, is we see who John's writing to. We've already touched base on this a little bit. We see the recipients. We see here in verse four, he's writing to the he's writing to the seven churches uh, that are in Asia. There are seven literal churches that we've already seen. Uh, they're pictured in chapter two and three as as lampstands. 
lampstands in a, in a dark world, uh, as the church that is to, is to shine in a dark world, to have a testimony. We are, we are the church. We are to have a, a testimony that, that just shines for Jesus Christ in a very dark world. These churches are that. Yet in all these churches, most of them uh, experience um, situations that require a correction in their, in their ministry, in their life. And so Jesus speaks to them, he encourages them, but he corrects them as well. He brings the correcting uh, word of God into their life. He's encouraging them as, as, we, as we see this. The churches here are in Asia Minor. You can see this on the map. Uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Cyrus, Philadelphia, Laodicea. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He's in prison. He can't escape. He can't go anywhere because of his testimony in Christ. It's a, it's a terrible place to live and to be. Uh, he's there. These seven churches, if he were to come off that island and come over into Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey, this would be the, the, the most likely route that these letters would go. Uh, these, these are connected by the Roman road that went through there, a major road that went through all these cities. And so the postal mail, as, you would, as, as it were, would go through these cities. And uh, so they would touch, they would touch these churches. Uh, so it followed that route. Now, Paul wrote uh, letters to churches as well, different churches, uh, Rome and, and Corinth and, and uh, Galatia and Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica. So, so the question is, I guess, why, why these seven churches? Why did he choose these seven churches and, and not the ones that Paul wrote to? It may be that he had a, he had a personal ministry with, with these churches. Um, we see, it, we see in, the, in the book of Revelation, we see in the scriptures, that numbers are very important. The number seven is very important. We see that here by this chart. There are just all kind of sevens that we see in Revelation. I'm not going to read that whole chart. We go clear back to Genesis chapter 1, and we see this. God created the earth, the world, the heavens, and the earth in, in six days, and then he rested on the seventh, which, which gives us that, that first glimpse of that number seven. His work was completed. It was perfect. It was done. And seven becomes, throughout the scriptures, often a, a description of the, the complete work of Christ or, or gives us a glimpse of a, part, of a piece and a part that really represents the whole. These seven churches that he's writing to are literal churches who are suffering and, and have literal needs, but they also, I believe, are representative of the churches also that, are, that existed then. Uh, these letters would have found their way into these other churches as well. And ultimately, they speak to us, the church today. And so the seven are representative of not only those that existed then, but are representative of his church and all of us. So what's the, what's the promise that we see here uh, in, in this chapter that's really significant as we look at that? So we see the recipients, the churches. We see the promise of God in verse 4. Grace to you and peace. That's the promise of God. Uh, it's a traditional greeting. It's in, it's in most of the letters, all the letters, really, the epistles we see. Uh, the, the Greeks would have used that traditional the greeting of, of uh, grace. And, and uh, uh, the Hebrews, the Jews, would have uh, used that traditional greeting of shalom or, or peace. And, and uh, so it was very much a traditional element of letters. It was a way of beginning letters, but it's, it's so much more than that. It's so significantly more than that, and that's what I want us to see this morning. Um, it's, it's, it's a promise from God. It's a promise from God to his people. And it's really important because in verse 4 it says, Grace to you and peace from him, from the seven spirits, and from Jesus Christ. And so, and so everything that's going to be written following, following this promise is tying back to this to these words right here words matter jesus says grace to you and peace he's speaking not only to these seven churches but right now he's speaking to you and to your life so what is the assurance he gives to us these words are true well that's what i want us to see this morning that's what i want us to look at let's look let's look at the assurance of god's promise let's look at Grace and peace. How how is that promise from God in these verses? How is it reinforced to these churches that He's writing these letters to? Chapter one is written for a purpose because what follows is the letters to these seven churches. He is presenting Christ to them before they read what is written to them as a as a specific church or to the church as a whole, which would be us. So He's going to assure us with His character and with who He is. So. There are three elements here. The first one is a look at God the Father. We see that in verse 4. 
that God is eternal, He is sovereign. It says that, that He is, He was, and He is to come. From Him who is that. That is, that is speaking ultimately of God the Father here. Um, and it shows that He has always been, He is eternal, He is in charge, He is sovereign, He's in control. What's really amazing to me, what it reinforces about grace is this, is that, is that God actually cares for us. He cares for you this morning. He is this, He is eternal. And He is sovereign. He has always been. And yet, yet the Scriptures are about His relationship with us. That He cares for us. And He stepped out of, he stepped out of uh, that sense of immense, immenseness that God is. And he, and he established a relationship with you and I. He's in control of all things. He was, He is, and He is to come. There's nothing that has happened in the past that exists now or is going to happen in the future that they will undermine anything that God is, His person, or what He does. He is sovereign and in complete control. Grace and peace. The peace is this, that God's in charge. God's in control in our life. No matter what's happening in our nation right now, God's in control. This is the God that we come to. And so we experience grace, we experience peace. Not only that, and there's some debate here in this next section, I believe it's clearly the Holy Spirit here because we see here in verse 4 there are seven spirits that are before His throne. We see that here in verse 4. Seven spirits before His throne. Some would say these are, these are uh, angelic spirits and we certainly see angels here in Revelation, the seven angels. But it really does not fit the context of the passage because what we have is, is a clear glimpse of God the Father and in the verse to follow, the phrase to follow, we have a clear expression of of God the Son. And so what we have here is a continuity, a, a, a presentation to us of God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how we normally say that. But how, that's how we have that here. And so we see we see the Holy Spirit. He is, he is before the throne. And yet the amazing thing is this Spirit of God who is before the throne and is represented in these seven spirits, which is again is that number seven, it's a picture of wholeness, a picture of completion. It's meant to identify here one, one entity, one, one uh, person of the Godhead, one deity, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and what we see here, the grace of God is this, is, is that He provided to you and I the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He touched your heart. He touches our heart when we are saved. And from that moment forward, we have, we have the provision of the Spirit of God working among us the peace in that is the Spirit of God is present. He's present in my heart. He's present in your heart. Every stretch, stretch of the way, He's with you, walking with you. Uh, how do we know that this is the Spirit of God and, uh, and not angels? Well, again, it's context. We see it here in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, we see these spirits before the Father, before the throne, seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. We see that here. That's important, okay? So we take that from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, uh, or 1 through 10. We see seven lamps. We see seven eyes. That's fulfilled here in this passage in Revelation chapter 4, 5. And it gives us the picture of those are the seven spirits of God. It completes that. It shows us that. It, under, it, it reveals that. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, we see Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. He has seven horns, seven eyes. Again, those are pictures. We're going to get there when we see that which are the seven spirits of God. Ultimately, this is a description of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God on His life, in His work, and in everything that He does. And so these two chapters and these verses uh, show the communion, harmony, unity of the Spirit of God with the Father, with the Son, working in tandem with them. With them. In, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, we see seven qualities of the Spirit of God, seven right there, as the seven spirits of God here in this verse 4 of chapter 1. And so we see these qualities. He's of the Lord. He is wisdom. He is understanding. He is counsel. He is might. He is knowledge. He is the fear of the Lord. All these things. So I believe in the context, it's clear from Scripture, the large Scripture, and the context here that it's the, it's the Holy Spirit. We see that from Revelation. We see it from this passage. It shows us the continuity of God at work, establishing and reinforcing and modeling the promise to us, grace and peace to you and I. Then we see, of course, Jesus Christ. We see God the Son. He becomes the focal point of the book of Revelation. In verse 5, we see that He is faithful to the end. He is the faithful witness. That's what He is. And so 
uh, from from the Father to this to the Holy Spirit now to the Son, we see again God reinforcing His promise to all of us that He is giving to us grace and peace. It is found in the character of the Father. It is it is found in, in the character and work of the Holy Spirit. It is found now in the ministry and character of Jesus Christ. So it builds into our life. You see, He is faithful to the end. He's that faithful witness. He is faithful at what? At being that witness, martus, martyreo, that word uh, martyr. He gave his life for us. He calls us to be willing to give up our life, uh, to die to sin, to die to him, to live to Christ. Um, so his life is in grace. His life becomes our example. Um, he gives us the pattern. We're not alone. He says, here's how I want you to walk, and here's how to walk. Here's my life. Follow my life. Follow my life and walk as, walk as I walk. Establish the mind of Christ. Have the mind of Christ. And his life becomes not only our example, his life becomes our enablement. That becomes the peace. I don't have to do it on my own. I can't do it on my own. He's there not only to be my example. He's there not only to be your example, to help you, but he's there, he's there at the same time to enable your walk. That's, that's the peace that comes. That's knowing that God will be sufficient for me. Chapter uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 just reminds us that what Jesus Christ started in our life in relation to the gospel and its complete work, he's going to finish. He is faithful. He will surely do it. Whatever he is, when he started that work in your life of salvation, he's going to complete it and finish it. We also see that he is the firstborn of the dead. In other words, he is, he is victorious over death. Uh, he knows your battle. He knows your fight. He's, he's fought the fight, the good fight of faith. He is won in victory. He calls us to that same fight. Uh, he won the battle over death. That's why he is the firstborn. He is, he is the preeminent one. He is the one who, he is the only one who under his own ability, his own strength, was able to rise from the dead and conquer death. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is preeminent in that battle. He is up to the task. And so in grace, he just reminds us, I fought the fight. I have fought the fight. We're going to have challenges and fights in our life for Jesus Christ. We're going to fight against sin. We're going to fight against uh, forces of spiritual darkness. He says, you know what? I fought that fight. There's grace available to you. Come to me because I have what you need. What an encouragement. And the peace is that, is this. He won that victory. He overcame. And he's going to call all these churches, he's going to call us, his church, to be overcomers. He's modeled that. He's promised that. That is grace. And that is peace for your life today. Not only that, but in verse 5 we see this. He is ruler of the kings of the earth. He is supreme over all. Over all mankind. Of all history. Of every generation. Past, present, and future. He is in charge. He is in control. And that's where the grace comes from. He is in charge. He's in charge of your life and my life. He's in charge of the things that, that come into your life. He is in charge of the things that are happening in this nation. He's in control. He is in charge. He is supreme. There's nothing that happens that is out of his control. And his plan, his promises, they cannot be undone. They can't be, they can't be nullified. I tell you what, that just brings peace to know that God is working and he will accomplish his work powerfully in your life. Because you know what? He's got a plan for your life. Your specific life, as you listen this morning, he has a plan for your life as it relates to what's going on in the world around you, the people around you, and in this world that we live in. And I tell you what, his work will never be undone in your life. Let him do his work, fulfill his work, with peace to know that God is there to help us. Not only that, he loves us. To him who loves us, that's Jesus Christ, he is defined by this agape love, this unconditional, this sacrificial love. His relationship to me and to you and to us who are listening is this. I am the very source, the very, the very definition of what love is all about. Don't let the world define love for you. You come to me, you come to scriptures, come, come to, to the work that I did for you on the cross and understand what true love is all about. We're going to see what that, what that means. And the grace is this, is we can declare boldly with confidence and just with real joy that he loves us richly, he loves us undeservedly, no matter what has happened in our life, no matter the scars, no matter the pain, He's there to show His love for us. And the peace is this. 
He's always working in our life, and He's always doing in your life and mine what is consistent with His love for you. Sometimes the work of His love is, is uh, calling us to repentance. He convicts us by the Spirit. But it is always bathed in the love of Jesus Christ. He loves you and I so much. So much. Never forget that. Also in verse 5, five, He freed us from our sins by His own blood. He, he delivered us. He is our deliverer. He's your deliverer this morning. If you know Jesus Christ... He is still delivering you. He did the work at the cross. Now that word delivery means, means to be loosed. He, he is loosing the grip of sin. He looses and defeats and overwhelms that grip of sin. It's like, it's like that uh, packet of Tide you throw in the dishwasher and you watch the commercials and, and, and it goes to work and, and sparkly clean dishes and, and all that. It's fizzing and fuzzing and all the dirt's being taken off piece by piece and that's what this, that's what God does in our life. He comes into our life and he cleanses us and he washes us and as we walk every day in faith, he is he is breaking the grip that sin that sin has on our life and, and and it can no longer it can no longer hang on to our life because we're surrendering to the spirit of God and to the word of God. And you want victory in your life and you want to be an overcomer in your life and you then you trust in Jesus Christ, you yield to His power and His strength, and He will do in your life what you and I cannot do. That is, that is so awesome. Um, he freed us from our sins by His own blood. He gave His life. The grace is this. He did in your life and in my life what we couldn't do. He has done for the world what the world could not do. He has provided a means to have a relationship with the Father, to know forg forgiveness of sins. He did it because He won the battle. He overcame, and He still does that. You know what? The peace of God is this, is that we, is that we are free. The peace of God is this, that we can be free. There is, there is no place for the child of God to just live in bondage. He's promised freedom. If you're in bondage to, to something right now, there is a means of victory. There is a way to overcome, and it's in Christ. We lose those battles. We struggle with those battles because we don't yield fully to Christ. I know that. I know the battles that I have and have had in my life, and they're not any different than your battles. They're personal, they're inward, they're spiritual, and Jesus Christ has promised to help us to be overcomers and to overcome. When we yield to Him, He breaks the grip of that sin. He does the work of overcoming that sin. What a beautiful picture. In verse 6, we see this, that He has made us a kingdom and priests to his God and his Father. He is the giver of all good things. He's the giver of all good things. He is, in grace, he's given to us a promise. That's the kingdom of God. Think about all the promises of God. They will be fulfilled in, th in this promise that's conveyed. We are experiencing some element of that kingdom now spiritually as we, as we engage in the, in, the, in the promises of God in character and in power. And someday we're going to experience that literally as we're in the very presence of God and, and the world is transformed. That is God's promise. That is grace and it's privilege. The, the concept of priests is the concept of access to God, is the concept of is we don't have to, to provide sacrifices for our sin. That sacrifice was given in Christ. Now we come to Him. We come to Him so that we would have a, uh, be clean before Him and have a clear conscience before Him because He's the one who cleanses and washes us. And so we maintain that, that whole holy relationship before God every day. We are priests. We have the privilege of walking with God and knowing God through Jesus Christ. He is the giver of everything that is good and the best thing that He has ever given is relationship with Him so that we can know the Father. What a beautiful thing. This work can never be undone. His kingdom will never be undone. The privilege that He gives to us will never be taken away. Sometimes we don't access it. Sometimes we don't even ask for it. Sometimes we don't even desire it. But yet it's there for the believer. He sets the table for us every day with everything that we need. He promises that to us. He gives us access of relationship. We can pray for others. We can invest in their lives. We can make a difference and, and show grace to others priests. We can talk to him in prayer. Say, Lord, I need you. And he's there. Exodus was promised this. Israel, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to be a holy nation. The church, 
He's promised we are a kingdom. Let us be grateful we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so we praise God because of that. We are a royal priesthood, the church. We are a holy priesthood. We see this. In verse 6, we also encounter this. He is worthy of all praise. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Worthy of all praise. The grace is this. As we worship him, we do so because of his victory. His victory strengthens our faith. He has dominion and glory forever. He's won the victory. Even now he's won the victory before it's even accomplished. It's already settled. It's already settled. It's going to happen. So we worship him. And his victory, his victory at the cross, his victory here in establishing his kingdom for all eternity, it just feeds our faith. It strengthens our faith. And that faith, the peace that it brings, is it, is it leads to genuine worship. When I trust God and I, and I access that grace into my life, then the peace of God is there. And I am able to worship God fully, even though the world around me might be just swirling and things that I cannot figure out and can't control and can't change. I come to the Lord and I just worship because I am at peace knowing that He's in control and He's bringing strength into my life and the victory ultimately is His in my life. What a beautiful thing. We come to verse 7. Behold, He is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. He, he is the judge of mankind. He is, he is there. He's going to come back again. He's going to return. And when he does, the world, the world is, is going to be distraught at their sin. The second coming of Jesus Christ, when they see him in glory come back, the church is already going to be with him. When he comes back, the world that is here then is going to be distraught at the appearance of Jesus Christ. Because he will come to judge. And the world, even those who pierced him, that's Israel. That's, his, that's, that's Israel itself. And the world at large is going to wail because of their sin. Israel specifically is going to wail over their sin. And they're going to be given grace to repent and turn to the Lord. But the world at large is going to wail, wail in absolute... Uh, um, agony in their hearts because they have turned from God, they have rejected Him, and grace has come to an end for them. Grace ends. Sin is going to be dealt with. See, that's a picture of grace. Because where, what would grace be if Jesus Christ ultimately didn't win the victory? What would grace be all about if, if we never got out of this in life? If when we die, this was the end of life? See, grace promises us a future, and it says one day all things will be made whole. And sin will be put behind us. That's grace. He does that in our life. He puts the battle of sin behind us. We can overcome. We can be overcomers and win against sin. God is going to right all wrongs. He, what peace. I trust you have that peace this morning. That if there's wrongs in your life, God can right those right now. One day He will right all wrongs. And so we live for Him. We don't try, we don't try to, to, um, to make things right here, we trust God to do that. We trust Him. We leave it in His hands. And we simply live with grace and love. He's going to come back with clouds and He's going to judge mankind. Daniel 7. This again, Revelation is built on Daniel. Here in chapter 7, we get a picture of, of Jesus Christ. With the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. That's Christ. He came to the Ancient of Days. He was presented before Him. That's the Father. To Him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom all people's nations language and his dominion is an everlasting dominion his kingdom will not pass away right here john 5 22 as we were in the gospel of john jesus reminded us that the father has given to the son all judgment and he will judge us now as we come to verse 8 we're, we're we encounter a choice here in verse 8 we are faced with a choice what are we going to do Last week I, I had this verse on the screen. I'm going to speak to that in just a second. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. The Almighty. The question here is, this is, is this God the Father or God the Son? I put this up on the slide saying this was God the Son. Well, that's true, but it's not the full picture. Um, and I'm going to show that here. Okay, Is this the Father or the Son? Let's try to answer that. Let's try to show that. So what's happening here is, is this a continuity in these verses, just Jesus Christ saying, now I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, and I am the Almighty. Or is it the Father who's, 
who's interceding into this text here. Because one of the questions is, if this is a father, why does he speak now, here? And what's, it kind of breaks things, does it? Well, not really. If this is the father, then what the father is doing is this. As, as these qualities of Jesus have already just been laid out, Jesus is, the father now says, I affirm this. I put my stamp on this. This, of what Jesus just said, it is true and it will come true. And so it is, it's his affirmation of this. So which one is it? Well, is it God the Son? It's a good question. Because in Revelation 21.6 it says of Jesus, and we're going to come to these passages later, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's right here in this verse, isn't it? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. It's clearly a reference to Jesus Christ here. So we have that term, first and last, Alpha and Omega, being used with Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, Behold, I am coming soon. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ. Important. Important. So I have the Alpha and the Omega that's, that's with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the, the phrase Lord God is, is mostly used in Revelation to refer to the Father, but it does also refer to Lord, to Jesus Christ. The, the word Lord. And of course, in the Gospels, in the New Testament, the word Lord is used of Jesus Christ frequently and all the time. So again, we see those terms can be applied to the Father or to the Son, Alpha and Omega, Lord, God, can be applied to the Father or the Son, either one, as we look through this first, um, and as we saw who was and who is and who is to come, or is it God the Father? We see here, uh, textually, contextually, let's look here in, in verse 4, as we started, speaking uh, grace to you and peace from him who, is, who was, who is to come, and, and is to come. That's the Father specifically there. So is John just picking up then a reference again to the Father with this terminology that he's now using? In Revelation 1.8, as we look at the Father, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the Almighty. That, that becomes a distinguishing uh, term in this verse 8, the Almighty. It means, it means uh, to be all-powerful, all-powerful. God is saying, I'm all-powerful. Now in John, we see this, verse 1 and verse chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 10, all things were made through him. That's power. Without him was not anything made that was made. Everything that exists in this world today was made through Christ. Everything that was created in this world today was created through Christ. Verse 10, he was in the world, Jesus specifically, and the world was made through him. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what we see here is that Jesus is all powerful. Jesus has all power. Almighty means all powerful. Almighty, Almighty means all power. That references and, and it is not inconsistent with the quality, the characteristic and the attribute of Jesus Christ. But I believe it's the Father here, okay? Um, because the word Almighty, as we have here in the Scripture, in the book of Revelation, is only used with the Father, not with the Son. There are nine uses of the word Almighty in Revelation. The other eight are clearly referencing the God the Father. It indicates to us contextually in the book here that what it's referencing and showing to us here that verse 8 is the Father. He is all-knowing. He is present. He is powerful. He, is the, he says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the Lord God who is, was, is to come, the, the Almighty. He is, he is what? He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. These terms show us that very quality of God. Jesus is that as well. The term Almighty is, uh, appears to be exclusively a term here in Revelation that is for the Father, not for the Son. Not, not in this book of Revelation. And so it doesn't break continuity or break context to, to, to understand and see the Father is simply affirming everything that's been said to this point. Now he puts his stamp of approval on that. What about the grace that's communicated in this, in this verse here? Well, this is God. This is who He is. For every moment, every day, every situation, there is grace. 
because God knows all things. He's all knowing. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. That's that's the first letter, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So all knowledge, everything, all those letters and everything in between that makes up our ability to communicate in words and language. All every all information is communicated through those that venue through alphabets. G, God is saying, I am the source, the breath of all knowledge. There's nothing that is to be known that is outside of my knowledge. There is nothing that can be known or discovered that is outside of my knowledge. I am all-knowing, and I know your life. I am in control, and I'm omnipresent. I, I, I was, and I am, and I am to be. I, I'm going to come. Okay. Uh, he has always been. He is omnipresent. He is powerful. He is almighty. What grace in our life. The peace is this. Is there nothing in our life that God can't handle? There's nothing in our life that, that God can't help us with. Our walk of faith, God is always there. So as we look, as we look at, at uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in these verses, they are by the attributes of their life, by the quality of their work, they are reinforcing one specific important thing in this passage, in this text, and that is, that is in verse 4. Grace to you and peace. He's writing to you right now. He's writing to the churches, these literal seven churches, the other churches that were there that Paul wrote to and that exist in that day, to us today. He's writing to us and he's saying, my promise to you is my grace. And my promise to you is my peace. And you need to know that I will fulfill and carry out my promises. And here's how, here's how you can have confidence in that. And he, and he shows us the character of God. And when we desire strength and wisdom for the day and we desire to be overcomers we always look to the word of god which shows us the character of god of our savior and we learn from that and we draw from the from the well and the reservoir of the character and the promises of god it reminds us as we close that revelation is again it's a context for relational ministry it is a confidence for relational ministry yours your your relationship to to God, to others, the circle of your ministry. Just think about this as we close. You know, just in our just in our relationship to God, uh, there's a confidence that comes when I'm able to demonstrate in my life that, that the power of God and the peace of God is at work. When I am able to exhibit that there is a there is that vertical relationship going on, and because because I have a vertical relationship that is alive, I have power in my life, the power of God. He's helping me overcome, and He's changing things in my life. He's conforming me to His image, and I have, and I have also the peace of God. And as I encounter difficult people and difficult circumstances, what's true in my life is the peace of God. And as people look into that, into my life, into your life as a believer, when they see those things, they are seeing they are seeing the strength of a vertical relationship with God. Do they see that when you look when they look at your life? Do you do you? Do you have that assurance as you examine your own life and look into your own heart? Do you see the power of God at work and do you see the peace of God at work? Is, is the character and the power and the person of Jesus Christ, is he being emulated in your relationships? Is he being emulated and modeled in your relationship before others? Do they see Christ in your life? Do they see the qualities of Christ come out in how you respond to them? Uh, how you engage them? Uh, your goals for relationship with them? The priorities of your life in relationships? Do they say you put safeguards in your relationships so that you'll remain pure and holy before God? Do they see God if with power in your relationships? Do they see Christ specifically in your life? And the last element is just this, the totality of our life. Last week we said our life needs to be a celebration to others. Well, that just really kind of makes it true, doesn't it? Grace and peace. Grace to you and peace. It's personal. It's who? It's to you. He's promised grace and peace to you this morning. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, He's promised to you the fruit and the power, the results of grace and of peace. To you. If you're listening, it's not about the person next to you, it's about the work of God in you. That's the important thing. And so when we, when we exhibit this relationally in our life, it becomes personal. And because it's personal... My life becomes a celebration of Christ. My life is a celebration that God is at work, and no matter what's happening in my life, 
no matter the challenges, and you and I do and we will face challenges, that Jesus Christ is in control now and forever. Because He is, my life is a celebration. My life does not spin out of control. My reactions to people do not spin out of control. My attitudes do not exhibit pride and arrogance and boasting. But instead, there is the humble power of grace in my life. There is the, there is the driving, motivating power of God's love in my life. It is a celebration to others. When they encounter my life, they, they experience the positive, renewing, refreshing work of Christ as they look at my life. I trust that's true for you this morning. That's the challenge here. Grace and peace results in a changed life. Father, we pray this morning that these things would be true. That relationally, this is where we are at. We're not perfect. And we need your grace and we need your strength every day. Lord, we, we long each day to experience the fruit of the peace of God because we have exhibited faith in your grace and your ability to be big in our life. And we come to you and say, Lord, change us. Lord, continue to do your work. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. We'll continue in Revelation next week.